There we go. Uh, Nicholas F says, what options do we have for secure two-way comms? Commercial crypto is many dollars and you can't run crypto over ham. Uh, if only there was a two-way two wireless SSH-based PKI system that was open source. A lot of gibberish letters there, and some of that I don't <laughs> agree with entirely. You can crypto anything. You could crypto over ham. You could put any kind of... I mean, they get mad if you encrypt on ham. Oh, let me, let me, let me change that. Yes. Oh, hold on, let me clarify. <laughs> you can't run crypto over ham. Oh, you absolutely can. Okay, yes. You can do Techno anything you want. Technologically, yes. Maybe you're, you're not supposed can. to, but I'm not I'm gonna go ahead and say that you to say that you can't would be an inappropriate inappropriate statement. You may not be allowed to, would be the way I would say that. How's that? Okay. Um what popped in my mind and this question can go on forever, but the thing that really came to my initially was um there's an app, actually. I'm not gonna say this is the best solution for all things, but it's called Signal. Mm -hmm. It runs on iOS, Android, and you can put plugins to your local browser. It is very well engineered for this purpose. You can actually set messages to be ephemeral, in which they can only last for 15 minutes, 5 minutes, an hour. So if someone doesn't see the message, they're self-destructive if they don't remember to delete it. Um, and it does deal with the cryptography in the right way in terms of the keys being local to the user, not being archived or stored by the intermediary third party. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, unless your key is compromised, that the crypto should be strong. And the fact that you can set ephemeral messages so that you can send it so, Ian, here's a message, I only want you to see it for the next five minutes, and then it's self-destructive, is a good answer. What's interesting about this is it's an excellent solution to replacing things like standard iMessage or Messenger or Skype or Facebook Messenger. Mm -hmm. However, for the most part, except for my DEF CON type buddies, no one wants to use it just because it's another thing, and they're used to the thing they already have, right. and they don't care if they're sending the stuff either in clear text and or encrypted by a third party. Apple Messenger, for example, is pretty decent, but key archival is a problem. Signal avoids all that. It's multi-platform, and I would recommend, boy, if we want to be crypto anarchists of a sort, or at least make the web darker, um, Signal's a great answer. Install it on your iOS device, your Android device, on your laptop, and use that as your default Messenger app. What you just said explains exactly why I stopped using PGP, mm -hmm. because it was a pain in the butt, and the vast majority of people I was communicating with had no interest in writing an email and then encrypting it and then copy pasting the encryption over to the email and then doing the reverse when it came back. Most crypto has a has a either a convenience a, a hit on convenience or a technological prevent or it's technologically preventative to people that don't want to be technologically adept. Right. This is why I was bringing up Signal. Signal ties to your phone number. The reason it ties to your phone number is it makes it easy for people to migrate away from another messenger app to use it. Yeah. So if you both install Signal, you can just bring over your contacts. And as long as the other person has Signal, you can just start using Signal now. Um, nice. I would really recommend people look at it heavily. The problem is, is just like anything else, getting people to go away from YouTube to watch your content somewhere else is like pulling teeth and <laughs> yeah. getting someone to stop using Facebook Messenger or stop using Messenger or stop using whatever their thing is to use Signal, even if Signal is extremely easy to use, is a very hard right. thing to do. It hard, it's hard to get inertia and to in, get people to care enough to move away. And in the near term, if you only have a very small number of people using it, what you've done is create this nice beacon of, hey, I'm doing something that you might want to look at more closely. This is where getting more people to use Signal or something like it, I think some reason, I mean, I'm, I'm not a paid shill for Signal, I have no association with them, but the reason I keep bringing it up is it is very easy to use. And if yeah. we can get inertia behind it and get enough common public mass of users to use it, it becomes, it, it normalizes it. Right. Just like using guns in a competition environment can normalize guns if we show them being used responsibly. Yep. Responsible use of crypto by a large volume of internet users will make it normalized, therefore not the needle in the haystack for them to pay attention to. Exactly. Yep. And if it's done properly, where the keys are archived with you, not with a third party, it's more secure. Even more so. So yeah. that's my answer to that for now. Okay. Uh, we now have a section on match questions. Uh, Tim says, question for both of us, what match are you most looking forward to attending in the next year? Well, I'm going to answer before the next year. I have one coming this year, Tiger Valley. That uh, was going to be my answer, too. I put up a video promoting this. It's going to be November 4th and 5th, I think it is. Uh, the promo video, I can put it in the link. Um, this match last was run in 2014. You never got to experience it. No, I've only heard about this. Uh, yeah, you've heard the, the days of lore and great adventure. <laughs> uh, but it really was and is. And so this match is so different than anything else. If you think two-gun action challenge match is different and unique, which it is, 
Mm -hmm. This takes that way, way to 11. Click. Um, it is far more an experience and a practical test of your skill and your gear than it is even a match. It is a match. There's mm -hmm. a score. There's a time. It started off as a four-man team match. That became hard to get four people to work together. I can imagine. Yeah. you got to coordinate time, vacation time, travel, all that stuff. Yeah. Um, so it turned into a two-man team match. And my gosh, this thing is fantastic. Running up cool. flights of stairs, carrying weights up the stairs, shooting at a 90-degree angle target straight down. Um, stages that run for five minutes. Mud, rain, nice weather, bad weather. Um, intel. Gathering intel and trying to determine things like... What color targets do I shoot? Pro, I... pro tip to anyone attending, let me tell you. So you're going through the intel. And it, the guy, literally, one of your teammates is in there going through a, a, a dummy body, finding pieces of paper, and it's just crazy stuff. Wrappers from a fast food restaurant. Something that looks like it turns out to be a stage description. Find the right intel. And I'm up on the second floor getting ready to shoot. And there's red targets, green targets, blue targets. This is just one example. And uh, my compatriot at that point, Russell Fagan, is going through it. It's like, the shoot targets are red and the hostages are blue. Shoot red. So you keep reading. <laughs> Turns out, except today when it's reversed. <laughs> Stuff like that's in there. Um, trip wires that you have to cross in a building while clearing a room. This Man. is TJ. Well, he's retired, but he was a SWAT team guy forever. Mm -hmm. And he tries to make a match that's civilian um, accessible. accessible that is the equivalent or even better than the SWAT championships. Nice. And that's what the Tiger Valley was. Okay. It died in 2014 because it was too physical and too hard for most people to want to go. Mm -hmm. And we are trying to relaunch it this year in November and using hopefully the clout of in-range to get enough people there to keep it alive. I hope so. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it and I'd love to have it continue. I, I, I cannot promote it hard enough. If you're into what we do at Two Gun, this is the match to go to. Red October is coming too. That'll be yeah. fun. But and not we'll quite on it. the same level. Tiger Valley is truly a test of you and your gear. So, now, we're not dressing up in costumes for Tiger Valley, but we kind of are for Red October. Yeah, the, Red, Red October is fun. fun. Red October yeah. is a fun match and a celebration, as they refer to it, of the AK. Yeah. That's in October. We'll be there for that. Tiger Valley really is. Now, by the way, we have a classic division of Tiger Valley this year. I threw that in there because I know that the viewers for In Range and Forgotten Weapons, would maybe there'd be a good chunk of you that would like to bring out your old-timey guns, your World War II gear. Uh, and the round count is cut in half okay. for people using That's classic good. guns. This will be a difficult match with modern guns. It'll be even yeah. harder with old guns, even with the round count cut in half. But like you said, we're dressing up in uniforms or whatever for, for October because it's the celebration of the AK. Yeah. Tiger Valley, we're bringing our best game, our best gear, and we want to see whether we win or not, we want to see how we deal with the presentation of challenges that TJ will put in front of us. Yeah. And I think that's actually going to be the culmination of the What Would Stoner Do project. It is. That's where we're going to finalize everything we've put yeah. into this effort. Uh, Eric says, given the opportunity to use them in a two-gun action challenge match, uh, which of the MP40 versus PPSH41 would each of you want to use? That's an easy, perfect question. You go first. I want the PPSH-41. Uh, it would not actually be my necessarily my first choice for a World War II machine gun, submachine gun. Um, as long as you have the opportunity to make sure that you have magazines that actually work with your gun, the PPSH is a pretty good shooter. Um, but I just really don't like the folding, wobbly folding stock on the MP-40. So... I agree with everything you said, but my answer would be the MP40 and not because it's German. The reason I would say that is because I have yet to ever encounter a PPSH-41 that freaking worked. Uh, not reliably This enough. is true. Um, I mean, you have to literally match the drum to the gun and then do wonky stuff like hold the drum at an angle or push pressure off forward on the drum or pull the drum back for it to run reliably. And uh, maybe there are some that don't have no. that problem, but every one of them I've used has been a problem. Every one of them I've used has been finicky about mags, but I've had enough that once I got the right mags, they worked. Okay. So, so that's my condition is for a, a two gun action challenge match, I would want to have two, two drums that work. And I think I could probably come up with a gun and two drums that actually fit in it. Although work. two drums with the rate of fire of the 41 still might not get you through a stage. Yeah, I think it would. It depends if there's range. Now, if you gave me the option of an MP41, oh, yeah. I'd be all over Easy. That. The MP41 yeah. is better than the MP40 in many ways. Or a Beretta 38 or a Suomi. I'd take all of those over either a 40 you or a PPSH. Options. If you had said of these, including the uh, Suomi, I would take the Suomi. So. I'd take an Owen, too. I haven't used an Owen. Yeah. I can't speak to that. Uh, Matthew says, during the Hard as Hell match, there were several times when you uh, needed to engage pistol paper targets on the ground, basically within arm's reach. Weren't you concerned that from a safety perspective, um, especially given the rocky soil, watching those parts gave me the heebie-jeebies? 
Kind of do me too, to be honest with you. Um, this is something some matches do and some don't. Um, there is absolutely nothing unsafe about having a target at a 45 degree angle that's literally one foot away, a paper target, obviously. As long as the soil behind it is just soft dirt. And it pretty much was there. Not entirely, but there's some rocks. But those are, those are placements that they've had targets at for a while. Hmm. So they, True. they use that range for all sorts of matches. And so those target placements where they put them very close and at that angle, for the most part, the ground behind it had been pulverized into some sort of fine sand. So the chances of you taking a frag from that is quite low. But I would say this, I do not like that many target presentations that close. I think it's a waste of ammunition and a waste of my time. Running by a target and shooting it at muzzle distance does not interest me. And unfortunately, the first heart of hell had more than that than I would like. And it is fair to say that if there was a rock behind that, it's not a good thing. Yep. So in general, I don't present targets like that at matches I design. And I would say that um, while it's probably not the safety concern you think it is, I would prefer to see less of it. Fair enough. Uh, Garrett says, in the various two-gun matches, I have noticed both Ian and Carl use a battle belt type system to reload from and carry things, uh, even showcasing such post hard as hell. Uh, what are your thoughts on plate carriers and chest rigs for this purpose, and how popular are they for two-gun matches like AG 2GACM? Well, Do you want to start? Sure. I, I don't like chest rigs very much. Um, I don't like plate... I don't like having stuff hanging off of my chest. The, what the belt does is it's very modular. It allows me to put my pistol on the belt, um, as well as a dump pouch, which are both things you can't really do on a chest rig or a plate carrier. And it's super easy to take on and off and modular. I can, if I want to put on a pouch for my stoner rifle bipod, I can do that. If I need extra rifle mags or extra pistol mags, it's not a big deal to just drop them on. Um, now I realize if you have a, like a Molly plate carrier, you can do that. But a lot of this stuff isn't quite so modular. I have more space on a belt. It's more convenient to use a belt for me. That's, that's kind of my rationale. I think there's a couple things here. First of all, you need a plate carrier and plates when you need plates. Um, in most yeah. match environments, we're not being shot at, thankfully. And so therefore having the need to defeat or have body armor on defeat rounds, inbound rounds is not a reality. Yeah. Now some matches have armored divisions and then you do wear plates for that reason if you want to play in that particular division. But plate carriers and plates are only something you put on unless you want to play in that division or you're actually going to be in an environment where you really want body armor. True. They are uncomfortable to wear if you don't have to wear them. They, they flat out suck. Now, there's, there's better carriers than others. There's better plates than others, etc. And that finished stuff I've been using lately has been fantastic. However, it is still a big, heavy, clunky thing. Yeah. And so at matches, speed is speed and accuracy is what matters. The ability to have agility to get over things in our environment or crawling up or whatever or being under things is more pertinent than necessarily having bulky armor on because we're not taking inbound rounds. So therefore, I would agree that the battle belt is the best solution for almost everything as long as you don't actually need the extra stuff that you would need with a plate carrier. Load-bearing vests and all that stuff, you don't need all that stuff. You don't need 17 mags, you need a couple mags. They look cool. They're more in the way than they are benefit. Yeah. Um, I should point out, I finally caved and bought a whole battle belt setup um, because before what I'd always been doing was just stringing everything I needed onto my pants belt. And I finally realized, you know what, I'm always kind of messing with this. It would be easier just to have a single setup that I could take off and had all my gear on it rather than, okay, I'm done with the match and I want to go to a restaurant. Now I have to thread all this crap off of my belt before I can sit down. You have down to get undressed. Car. Yeah, basically. No, that's a good point. This is another thing that the battle belt and a properly set up uh, plate carrier or load bearing yes. vest does have. Yep. So I need all this stuff. It's ready to go. Put it on, put on the belt, go, done. When you're done, take it off, put it away. Yeah. Or, for example, on my battle belt, I do have a fully loaded uh, IFAC, an in the, you know, individual field medical kit mm -hmm. in my back. And it's back here where I can't really get to it. However, my battle belt just has a clip. Yeah. If I need something on the back of that belt or someone else needs it off my belt, literally click the Boop. click, pull it off, throw it on the ground, open it up. So the ability to put this stuff on or off or limber it in ways that you may or may not want. For example, a backpack I need to carry from here to here this stuff. I don't need a backpack when I'm doing this. I take the backpack off, ditch it. Battle belt has everything I need for the stage. Put yeah. the backpack back on. This is, you know, you see them doing this in World War One or yeah. earlier. You see yeah. this idea of you need this for this, but not for that. And you need this when you're hiking but you or marching, but you don't need this when you're in combat. Yeah. And so the same rules apply now. Mm -hmm. And the ability to take this off, get to it, put it back on, apply. Yeah. I, it's harder to jump over stuff when you got a, a big chest rig full of 
crap. This is why we have an armor division two gun action challenge match because we do have some real world guys that come shoot the match and they want to use it as a practice environment. Yeah. Border patrol, law enforcement, and we love having them there. But I noticed that they didn't come in their kit. And they do wear this stuff. The Border yeah. Patrol oh, SWAT yeah, team do. guys, they have they to. They totally they, do. They are truly at risk. And so um, I put an armor division together mostly to allow them to come and be inspired to use their real world equipment at the match because right. you would never do it otherwise because guess what? It actually holds you back. Your scores are worse. Your accuracy is worse. You're fatiguing faster. You're overheated quicker. And so the only reason to wear it is for training purposes and by providing a, a division for it, it encourages them to do that. Yeah. Uh, Alan says, uh, when shooting a right-handed bolt-action rifle left-handed, which hand should you use to work the action? This is right up your alley, so I'm leaving it to you. Yeah, pretty much. Um, I like shooting, when, when I do that, I use my firing hand. Um, I use my right hand to work the bolt because it's on that side of the gun. Uh, if you use your left hand, you have to reach over the gun, and I find that pretty awkward. The one exception would be if I was actually using a shooting sling, uh, which would mean basically if I was shooting prone with a shooting sling, then yes, it's awkward to reach over the gun, but it's more awkward to undo the sling every time you have to cycle the rifle. Um, you can watch Saving Private Ryan to watch, I don't remember the actor's name, yeah. uh, playing the sniper, shooting by reaching over the gun. Um, I mean, he makes it look cool, but he's not actually shooting. I think you slightly misspoke. You said your firing hand. You mean your non-firing hand. So when you're shooting left-handed, oh, I'm sorry. Yes. When you're shooting, when yeah. you're shooting left-handed, your hand. This is your firing yeah. hand on the trigger, and this yep. is this. Your, your right hand is your support hand. And we've watched right. you do this crazy waka yeah. waka thing, but you use what, your right hand to cycle the bolt. What I do is kind of use the inertia of recoil to help my firing hand keep the gun um, elevated. And when you do it right, you're basically pulling the bolt open as the gun comes up, and you're pushing the bolt closed as the the gun comes back down onto target. And by the time you're back on target, the action cycled. And you've got a grip on the gun again. Doesn't always work that way in practice, but that's the idea. I'm not wrong-handed, but we do do support side stuff at our matches, and I've mm -hmm. had to shoot bolt gun support side, and I do exactly. I don't do it the same way you do, but I do the same thing. My firing hand stays on the gun. Yeah. My right hand cycles the bolt. And yep. you know what? When I'm shooting right-handed, guess what? The same hand still cycles the bolt because yeah. the bolt's on the right side. Yeah. Left hand holds the gun. Right hand cycles the bolt. I have a lot of people ask me about left-handed bolt action rifles. And it's honestly gotten to the point where I would I don't want a left-handed rifle because I've gotten so much practice shooting right-handed rifles that it would not be helpful for me to have the bolt switch to the other side not of the gun at this point. Not worth your time or effort anymore. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now we have just some general questions. Yep. I think we have a whole slew of general questions. Uh, Dana says, I'm interested in who you guys are. What is your favorite band and why? We learn a lot about guns from you guys, but we don't learn about you. You guys are the reasons I watch and support. Oh, wow. well, that's a kind statement at the end, for yeah, one, first of you. all. Thank you, Dana. That's very nice to say that. Um, I, 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 I assume people support in range because they like what we do for content, but this person says that they like us for us, which is cool. Yeah. Uh, and so that's why I threw it in there, because we do get questions like this quite often. Sure. So why don't you start? Uh, well, um, as far as music goes, uh, band I've been listening, I probably listen to more than any other single one, is Nightwish. Um, they're kind of a somewhat melodic metal band. Um, they have a female lead vocalist, which I, I like. I don't like growling, uh, but I do kind of like the metal genre, um, if I can separate it from growling vocals. So progressive metal? Yeah, some of that too. So what's another yeah. one, for example, if Nightwish is one? Is there another example? Um, boy, I wasn't expecting the question. Yeah, I didn't see? think about this. Um, on the spot. Well, actually, I'm going to twist this around. I also like a lot of uh, traditional Celtic music, something people may not know about me, or may at this point, I don't know. Um, I actually uh, grew up playing the bagpipes, so I've spent seven or eight years seriously playing bagpipes. Kind of got out of it when I went to college, because weirdly, it turns out a dormitory is not an ideal location for playing Highland bagpipes. Hmm. Um, but I, I continue to enjoy the, the music, uh, both traditional, very old traditional pipe music, as well as modern Celtic music. And there are a couple bands out there that do cool modern rock interpretations of stuff with pipes. Um, yeah. They're right. little tiny bands that nobody's ever heard of. Wow. Um, probably the biggest of them was called Seven Nations. I don't like their la late music, but I do like a lot of their earlier music. Okay. So me will be something no one's ever heard of, or maybe very few of. Um, it's a band that's no longer together. Uh, it's called Babyland. Um, okay. It is an industrial electronic punk group. Go figure. <laughs> um, they, 
uh, their music was awesome. They were very unique and different. Uh, one, there were th really there were three band members. There was the singer, there was the drummer, and or a guy that used buzz saws and things on stuff, <laughs> including like fifty-five gallon oil drums. And they would you would go to a Babyland show wearing goggles because otherwise you would get eye damage from sparks flying into the audience. That doesn't really sound like my thing. The third band, the third band member was a old school Macintosh that was used as a synthesizer. <laughs> and uh, their music is awesome. Their message is fantastic. It really. It, personifies and iconifies the punk industrial electronic concepts and they were unique and different never got big they did well but never made it big and they kind of dissolved and just kind of gave up a while back um, okay i can link to some of their stuff in the links below um absolutely to me that is the quintessential best industrial band of all time all um, right although a lot of people haven't heard of them um, outside of that, a lot of other industrial stuff like Skinny Puppy, Liebox, one I've mentioned before. Skinny Puppy's another big favorite of mine. And then after that, I actually really like Baroque, hmm. Bach, that kind of stuff. So cool. I have a wide diversity of music, but if I was going to put one band out there, I'm going to put Babyland out there, and I'll put some links in the description. Cool. All yeah. right. Um, one totally not about us. Um, sorry. Uh, Austin asks, what are your thoughts on the Holbrook device for the M1 Garand? Uh, does it take away too much historical feel from the rifle, or does it provide a bit of help to the modern shooter in a stressful environment? Do you know what it is? I did, and now I'm racking my brain because I didn't pre-read all of these Okay, that's questions. fine. Let me go for this first, and then you'll know. You'll yeah. remember immediately. It, um, it modifies the gun in a way that it no longer... It, the bolt has to be is held open manually, and you have to accidentally, intentionally close it. Okay. And it does not eject the clip. Okay. Yeah. So you hold it back, put in the round. You can single feed. You can put an M-block clip in, single feed, and then release it, and then chamber a single round. Okay. Or yes. when it's done firing all eight rounds, the clip stays in. It doesn't auto-eject the clip, and the bolt locks back until you put another clip in, and then right. you manually release it. Yeah. That's what that yes. is. Yes. And I remember years ago trying to find one, and I never did actually find one. There's a website that's selling but, them right now. Yeah. So my first thought on this is this. It, it's cool for a match environment. If you were shooting it in high power or something like that, or you wanted to just sing, single shoot the gun, or something that was outside of its original goal of being a combat rifle, I get it. In terms of using it in a match, like a run and gun or a speed related match or in combat, I think it's absolutely the opposite of what you want. And you absolutely want the M block clip to eject automatically. And, and you do want the bolt to try to close right. automatically. It generally doesn't, you have to hit it a little or give it a little Tap. slap. Yep. But I, I think the M1 in its current, in its current, its original guise, where the ejects automatically and tries to close automatically, is the best thing for a combat rifle. Totally agree. If I was, if I wanted single loading, I'd just buy a little single loading sled. Mm. And the reason I think people are going to go, well, then why would you want the AR to lock back automatically? And I say it's different because it's box magazine fed. Right. Totally. The, yeah. Because the end, what happens in the M1 Garand is the end block clip needs to get out of there to be out of the way to put the next one in. And so with the Holbrook device, that's still in there. So you'd be doing this to dump it out or pulling it out to get it out of there. Then installing the end block clip and then releasing the bolt, which would be much slower in practice and in stressful situations. On an AR, you're dropping the mag, putting the mag in and just closing it. Right. That's the, the difference is that it's box magazine fed versus end block clip fed. Uh, Brian says, I have a feeling you'll find this a ridiculous topic. Okay. Uh, but I recently learned about the auto glove. Oh, God. Yeah, I saw this thing. Do you have any actual viable use for... Do you see any viable use for rapid fire devices like this or slide fire stocks, the BMF adapter, bump stocks, I'll throw in Hellfire triggers, uh, or any other products you may have seen at SHOT Show? Uh, or are they just fun at the range? I'd be interested to see uh, them in a match, but any practical application seems questionable. Extremely questionable. I would take the position that they're probably not even all that much fun at the range because they probably don't really work all that well. And what you see online is the culmination of a lot of different video takes to try and get one awesome looking mag dump with a Hellfire trigger or a BMF thing or I really have no interest in it. We did experiment with the slide fire stock on yes. bipod mounted uh, RPK and yep. AR-15. Oddly, the RPK was always troublesome. Um, yeah. The AR-15, believe it or not, we actually got pretty good success out of that. Yes. Um, with a bipod, it'll actually rock on the bipod and allow the slide fire, it kind of gives the slide fire a little extra oomph. Yeah. And I would say, I would argue that from a practicality perspective for someone who was challenged in a way that they couldn't get something that was legitimately full auto for a squad automatic weapon, when on the bipod, an AR-15 or derivative thereof with a slide fire could be applied. That is the only one of these things that I see any quasi-practical use for. The binary triggers are uh, a, a don't dangerous wanna, gimmick. Yeah, don't and like the, the auto glove, in the video promoting the auto glove itself, that is a terrifying video. <laughs> 
there is, I believe it's a man or a woman or both, firing a pistol with that auto glove, and you see that gun climbing like this because that thing is going and they don't necessarily know how fast they can get on or off that trigger. And this is, this is very close to this, which has happened with uh, fully automatic uh, yeah. pistols, Yep. Uh, machine pistols. There's been a number of instances of people actually bringing the gun back into their own face. Or and, someone next to them. And the reality is the only reason garbage like this exists is because Americans put a value on something that they just can't have because of NFA restrictions. Right, it's the machine gun taboo that makes these things exist. And then... This, one, the, these are the equivalent of teenagers drinking Everclear. Yes. That's a very good way to put that. Yeah. And so, I'm not, we're not trying to be fun extinguishers. They don't have fun ever. But have safe, yeah. responsible fun and drink responsibly <laughs> and use your slide fire responsibly. Yeah. That auto glove is ridiculous nonsense and it is an example of a product trying to fill an environment that's more interested in, gee whiz, look what I can do with my gun rather than actually putting an emphasis on responsible handling and skill. Yeah. And I get heat for calling out skill, but I think that that's one of the great things you can do with a gun. Yeah. Going to the range and learning to be good with it is a satisfying thing. Mm -hmm. It feels good to hit your target. It feels good to have a good, whether you win or not, it feels good to shoot a stage well. Yeah. And I would say the people that haven't tried this don't understand how cool that is until they do it. Going to square range and just blasting, that can be fun, but you see products like this filling a niche, niche for people who no longer find that fun. Yeah. If, that's no, can, if, yeah. if just going shooting is no longer fun, get rid of this, get rid of the glove, go shoot a match. Yeah. Go get better with the gun, you'll have more fun. Yeah. Do you agree or am I wrong? I totally agree. Okay. Say, so, And it doesn't have to be a running gun match. No, it doesn't. It could be long range. It could be bullseye. It could be anything. It could be 17 position small bore. Yeah. So give yourself a challenge yeah. beyond how quickly can I turn this magazine of money into noise. Yeah. And, and, and you've become a, a accomplished competitor at this point. Yeah. But I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but it's fun, right? It's extremely fun. And yeah. it's satisfying to watch your skills get better. Absolutely. I wouldn't still be doing it. Okay. So, so I'm not that annoying, annoying guy that's the fun extinguisher. <laughs> yep. Uh, let's see. Cyrus says, what's your opinion on the SIG 320 kerfuffle? I literally don't care. I don't know if that's the wrong answer. I don't care. Okay, you drop a gun and it fires. That's pretty bad. That's stupid. Lots of guns probably could have done that. Single action army Colt could have done that. What it does indicate is that there's a problem in the uh, <laughs> in the acquisition and the, uh, the the standards of drop testing obviously have a hole in them. Yes. Two holes now that the gun went off. Do you care? Not really. I'm surprised people get so riled up about this. You know what's funny about that is that if they adopted the SIG, P, the, the SIG 320, and it turned out to be the best pistol that man's ever had, and it worked perfectly, and it allowed, and it destroyed everything ISIS related, because we dropped that pistol, we win the war. You know what you would hear about the SIG 320? Nothing. The fact that you can drop it and it'll fire, the entire gun world is in a hoopla, and the gun gets more press than it ever would have had if it had been a perfect success. This is an example of the human desire to pick on something that failed versus to qualify something that's a success. Yeah. Maybe that's an exaggeration, but that's why it gets so much kerfuffle. Yeah, I think it's just an, an easy target of opportunity. Um, SIG shouldn't have let it out the door with a problem like that in the first place. They're going to fix it. I think they would have fixed it even without all of the media attention that it got. I do find it amazing that they made such a stupid design mistake. Yeah. It's kind of obvious. It is surprising. It is the reason the block has a dingus. Yeah. It is. Yeah. That is what the dingus is for. Um, the There's other... not enough inertia when it hits the ground for that thing to uh, deactivate. But an example of this being the kerfuffle that it is and what I'm saying is that, so if you look at the mud test videos, mm -hmm. the AK ostensibly failed, has two point, at this point 2.7 million views. The AR-15 video in which the gun worked has 600,000. The, the Vietnam era AR-15 view uh, video that, were, that worked again has less than that. So the gun that that people expect to work that failed gets this yeah multi everyone shares the hell out of it failure draws the guns that work like the luger which frankly was an astonishing of the luger working in the mud surprised the hell out of me yeah i expected that to be a failure of all accord does not get shared yeah like the ak that did fail well failed ish because of expectation and people like to poke things that didn't work yeah simple also, there's really nothing for us to say about or add to the 320. It's like the trigger has too much mass, and when it hits the ground, the trigger goes back, and then it fires. So reduce so. the mass of the trigger or add a dingus. Yeah. Duh. 
Uh, Zachary says, I've seen Ian's RDB pop up every now and then over the past year. How is he liking it? I thought this was a good one because we gave it away. Yeah, I don't have it anymore. We gave it away to a Patreon supporter a couple months ago now. We did give it away to a Patreon supporter, so check that out. And that's another reason to support us on Patreon. We give away things like RDBs. Yeah. Not all the time, but we do give away cool stuff. Yeah. But that said, before you give it away, you did like it. Yeah. Um, I, there was really nothing fundamentally wrong with it. My overall conclusion on that thing was it does everything 95% as well as an AR. I have no specific need to have a long barrel in a relatively short overall length. And so there's no rationale for me not to just use an AR. Um, I really prefer my what would stoner do AR over the RDB. Uh, Scott says, what's a normal day for Ian and Carl at the range like? Uh, what do they do for training when they're not shooting matches or testing out some crazy old gun? God, you know, I brought that, I threw this in there because at this point, with the amount of work that you have to put in with forgotten weapons, but yeah, also I don't, in, I don't have time to shoot anymore. <laughs> kinda, I <laughs> almost. Mean, well, even within range, I mean, yeah. obviously, a lot of our content is match related because it, the match is used as our lab environment to test out concepts or guns. Right. And so that is a normal day at the range. The opportunity for you or I or both of us or even individually to just go shoot is vanishingly small. Yeah. We don't get a lot of time beyond what you see on film. That's the downside to doing something as a job is you doesn't, it's not so much your recreational hobby anymore. So generally me going to the range even by myself when I'm not filming is just me prepping something for the next video. Yeah. Like for example, zeroing this or changing out an optic or making sure that works or whatever. And so there is very little just let's go have fun and shoot left. Yeah. Now, we do it, and it's fun when we do it. The matches are fun anyway. Don't yeah, get me wrong. Yeah, totally. But, but, but the just go and not be filmed doing something with a gun, not very much of that. Yeah, not a lot. Um, yeah. We do occasionally do that with friends who are visiting. Yeah. We'll throw some junk in the car, you know, because we have access to a lot of interesting guns that other people don't. So and it's I'm, like, hey, welcome yeah. to Arizona. What do you want to shoot? And it, <laughs> and it does become compelling to do it, on, or at least always have video running, because sometimes I've gone when I'm not planning to film something, and something happens, and I'm like, Crap, I could have used that. That would have been really cool content. <laughs> and so you get into this mindset of film everything, which then becomes the overhead of filming everything. Right. It's an interesting Catch-22. Yeah. Uh, Phil says, would you guys be interested in organizing a cleanup for some of the outdoor desert shooting areas? Yeah, I would. Um, okay. We had some contact with Natural Restorations, which is a group that does it here out here in Arizona. Mm -hmm. And he sent me an email or a message or an IM or a something at some point, and I can't find the message. And I want to have him on the channel because those guys do good work. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is another example of responsible firearms ownership, especially Absolutely. in yeah. states that have BLM land for us to shoot on. Yeah. And so one, please don't trash these places. Don't shoot glass bottles. D don't, or paint cans. Yeah. Please just don't. And, and if you're going to bring something out there that's fun to shoot at, like, I don't know. Soda cans. It's aluminum. It stays together. It's one piece. You can just pick it up and throw it away. TV you can set, recycle it when you're TV done. TV sets are an example that leave a mess Ugh. behind. But you know what? If you make a mess, clean it up. Yeah. But people like Natural Restorations or others that take out, again, the small percentage, go out there and clean those places up. That's what, keep those place, that's what keeps those places open as public facilities for the public. Right. So you can't expect the government, you can't be surprised when the government goes out to a spot and it looks like Chernobyl. <laughs> Seriously, some of these places look yeah, like really hell. Yeah. Look like Chernobyl, and there's like dead animals and a shot up cactus and something that was set on fire last week. God. I'm serious. Yeah, I know. I and, know. And, and, you, I and, then, and, laughing, then, and then they shut that range down for shooting, and people were like, damn the government. Well, you know what? I get that, but you know what? Damn the people that did that is yeah. the better answer. Shun them, and places yeah. people like Natural Restorations or others that clean those places up are doing great work and we need to if you're watching this please contact me again because i can't find your direct contact information and we would like to have you on the show yeah uh carl this is from charles uh, carl did you receive your walther ccp back from recall and will be will you be using it as a carry handgun once more i i, I took this question because we get this a lot and mm -hmm. i have to be very honest i never sent it in um i put out the recall video out there because i wanted to make sure that since we did a video promoting the gun as a good gun or at least mm -hmm. i consider it to be a good gun by the way i still consider it to be a good gun because uh, it's never failed me um I wanted to make sure that people were aware of it and that they took care of it should they see the need to. When I came to find out what the actual problem is, uh, I didn't... It's not really relevant. To I me. went, oh, okay. Well, I got a lot of stuff to do, and so I will get to that someday, and never did. The problem turns out that if you were to short stroke the slide and not bring it far enough back to the fullest extent of travel, 
You can chamber around but not engage the striker on the sear. Therefore, the striker is riding on the firing pin. Therefore, if the gun is dropped, mass and inertia can cause it to fire. I'm gonna tell you right now that's never gonna to happen to me because of the way I run my guns. I am then therefore taking the potential risk of accidentally doing that, which isn't going to happen. However, I'm not saying you shouldn't send it in. You should, but I never did. Now, in terms of me still carrying it, yes, I will, because I will make sure that I cycle the action all the way. At some point, I will eventually send it in. However, at this point, I am now working with a Red Dot, a Delta Point Pro Enhanced Glock 19 from KE Arms. Mm -hmm. And that is my current primary carry gun because I want to give a review of not only the gun and how it, what its capabilities are or are not, but also what it's like to actually carry a Red Dot Glock all yeah. the time. So right this minute, I'm not carrying it. However, if I want to have a small, easily concealed gun, I would still certainly would okay. because I'm not worried about the problem. Cool. Uh, Mitchell says, why are there so few companies making new production 303 British ammunition, seeing as the Lee Enfield is generally well-liked and still reasonably available? I felt like this was more you. Um, I think there are plenty of companies that are making it. Um, I know Winchester makes it. I know PPU makes it. Uh, I haven't actually looked prior to filming this, but you can get 303 British from most all of the major ammo production companies. Uh, there certainly is no shortage of it. Uh, it's expensive, but it's right on par with all other, you know, basically hunting production rifle ammunition. I don't shoot 303 at all. Is it comparable in cost to, say, commercially manufactured low price 308? I, yeah. Or is it more? I think I would expect to pay, well, if you're, like, if you're going into Sportsman's Warehouse or something, it's going to be 25 or 30 bucks a box probably. But Gosh. what you're going to be getting are hunting soft points or some sort of expanding bullet. I think he's talking and, blasting ammo here. Well, that's the thing. There isn't, you don't really get rifle caliber blasting ammo unless the Russians make it. Well, yeah, but there's still cheap 308. I think, I think what you're dealing no, with- No, there isn't. The cheap 308 is the surplus. Oh, unless you buy steel case Russian That's it. stuff. Yeah, right? otherwise you're spending 75 cents or a buck around. It's also, I would say there's also an element here of supply and demand. Yeah, there's not much demand for it. There's a lot of people that own Enfields and don't shoot them. Yeah. Or if they do shoot them, they shoot them in low volume. Yeah. And therefore the need to manufacture large volumes of 303 is not there. Right. And there's definitely more people shooting 308. Yeah. Or equivalents thereof. And the other thing is, if you're making 308, you can use that tooling to make military ammo. Um, I don't know how many of the companies do, but there are a lot of official security organizations that might buy your 308 NATO ammo. There's nobody out there like in security agency land buying volumes of 303 no. British. So if you're making it, you're making it exclusively for the hunter and collector market. And you know what? You're starting to see the same thing with 54R right now. Mm. 54R was coming in in mass quantities and surplus and it was mm -hmm. dirt, dirt cheap. But yeah. In fact, it was the cheapest round to shoot period, the end. Yeah. And that surplus is still around, but it's not being imported like it was. I think Ukraine has had a big impact on that. But Makes sense. The point is there's yeah. not as much 54R surplus. And so now the void has to be filled by commercially manufactured 54R. Yep. Now there, there is Russian stuff that's steel cased, which is mm -hmm. fairly reasonably priced, but not reasonably priced like the surplus was. Sure. And American manufactured 54R, holy Moses. Yeah. $2 it's, a round or something like that. I mean, yeah. maybe a dollar a round at the best. It's pretty typical. Very expensive. But yeah. same thing you're seeing with 303 British. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you're looking for surplus, look for Greek uh, HXP. It mm. is non-corrosive and reloadable, and it is fantastic stuff. Um, I think someone might have been cheaper than dirt. Maybe I got it because everybody oh, still hates. Oh, don't mention them. Everybody still hates cheaper than dirt, so I was able to Now we're going to see that in the comments for the rest um, of our lives. It might not have been them. Someone brought in or got another batch of Greek 303 like two years ago. And by the way, Greek HXP 30-06 is excellent too. Yeah. So apparently Greeks make good ammo. Yeah, they really do. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. PPU is good. HXP is good. British World War II surplus is not good. Um, South African is good. If you find that, it's in like 48 round cardboard boxes. Don't do British. Don't do Pakistan. Is the British stuff click boom? Yeah. Yeah. The British stuff is like 1945 dated. And it's just, you don't want that. You really don't want Pakistani. Um, Greek, <laughs> Greek, South African is good. Okay, fair enough. I laugh because Pakistani ammo in general has been very dubious. Uh, Andrew says, what weapon do you most regret buying? You probably got well, more. You, you have more <laughs> options of regretting something than I do, I think. I regret nothing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, with the exception of a couple guns that were like broken and I didn't realize it when I bought no, them. Sure. Um, actually, I think the best thing to, to use here is one of the very first rifles I bought, 
geez, when I was in high school, I think, was a 308 Vepper uh, or Veeper, a 308 caliber AK, 16 inch barrel, because, and I think this is a, a worthwhile parable here. I did a whole bunch of reading on gun forums at the time. Facebook wasn't a thing yet. And boy, I figured out exactly what gun was going to be absolutely perfect and do everything that I wanted it to do on paper. And I never actually touched one. And I, I bought one with like high school graduation money. And I put a bunch of money into that thing. I don't remember what, but it was a significant purchase for me at the time. Yeah. And uh, lo and behold, it kind of sucked at everything that I wanted to do with it. Um, and what, what I see in that now is the first gun you buy is probably always not going to turn out very well. Um, I would strongly encourage people to shoot guns that friends own, shoot rental guns at ranges, get an actual hands-on experience with the gun that you're interested in, doing what you're interested in doing with the gun before you go out and decide to buy something. Uh, reading up on stuff on the internet is all well and good, and it is helpful, but nothing really substitutes for hands-on experience with it. And even beyond that, I think there's a pretty good chance that the first gun you buy, your taste will change. You'll Once you get some good shooting under your belt, you'll be like, oh, this really isn't what I want to be shooting at all. And I would say, accept that. Um, don't, don't go, just don't blow your whole budget on something super expensive because you think that it's going to be the one be all and end all gun. What Arfcom said it was? Uh, it probably wasn't Arfcom at the time. No, I'm just I don't remember example. what for him. But yeah, uh, you know, I think you, you've talked about how like your first gun was a Lee Enfield. It was. I, I don't regret it though because you, it was a good gun. It just beat the hell out of me. Right, but you don't really shoot a Lee Enfield anymore. Nope. Still a good gun. Not sure why that was my first yeah. one, to be honest. But I think the honest you reason... You just never know. You don't have the experience to know what you're actually looking for. I think for. the reason that was my first gun is, quite quite frankly, is it was cheap. Okay. At the time, those were cheap. Those were like the most in the gaunt cheap. I mean, they really were cheap. That's there. true. They were yeah. cheap. And I think that was the reason. Okay. Um, you know, it's interesting. I don't know that I'd use the word regret because re you always can learn something. Mm -hmm. But I can think of two guns, which are actually the same gun, which I would not say regret, but were definitely in this category. Type 14 Nambus. <laughs> I, I didn't regret okay. anything because I learned about them, and what I learned is they're pieces of shit. Um, I, I had one, I'm like, oh, it's got to be just this one. It's got to be just, okay, because, I mean, everyone says the 94 is the, is the bad one. The 14 is at least serviceable. No, it isn't. The Type 14 is garbage, and then I got another one going, okay, this one will be better. No, that one was garbage, too. I broke multiple firing pins, spring problems. No. Just no. Just no.